What's up, guys? Uh, today we're going to do uh, <clears throat> a reading here from Antiquity Unveiled, J.M. Roberts, for uh, the spirit testimony of Diva Bodhisattva. And that's uh, spelled D E V A B O D H I S A T O U A. And he was a Buddhist prophet. Uh, so we're on port page uh, 48 here. Um, Saib, I salute you, sir. In all things pertaining to the spirit and mortal life, experience must be the guide and reason the teacher. It is my duty as a spirit being appointed by the higher order to come here to tell you what I know of what are termed the Christian Gospels, more particularly those relating to what are termed Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Right here, I might go, go into a personal history of myself in order that you may understand more thoroughly what I herein set forth. I am of a line of teachers or prophets from Buddha down. Whether you can obtain through the encyclopedias of today the information I shall give you, I cannot tell. But if you can, obtain the Japanese encyclopedia of 1821 translated by Emil, Abel Remusat, R-E-M-U-S-A-T. And you will be able to learn a great deal about myself. In the Sanskrit tongue, my name was Diva Bodhisattva. In the Chinese tongue, my name was Fosa. And in the Hindu tongue, it was Ma Ming. I commenced exactly as this man I am using today, a trance medium. In the Marhabara country, and it was it was I who first taught in India long before the Christian era. The metaphysical allegorical style claimed to have come from the one who never existed called Jesus of Nazareth. These gospels were transferred to Singapore, where they afterwards fell into the possession of Apollonius of Tyana. The original names in your modern tongue would represent the four seasons, but were afterward used or misused to typify a savior of men. The originals, as understood by the Hindus, were in this way. First, the presentation of the ground, the planting of the seed, the harvest of time in gathering, and the feast time or harvest home. This was what those books interpreted by the aid of certain stars in which is now termed the zodiac meant. The star in the east was simply a signal of seeding time or planting time. Now, these mysteries were used by Hindus to show certain things occurring in the life of man that resembled the offices of nature, such as infancy, youth, maturity, and old age or death of man. You see, the beauty of these things when properly understood First, the stars, used then as an almanac. Second, the seed of time, harvest. And third, their analogy to the life of man. These writings or gospels were given to me, first, as I have set forth in the beginning of this communication, by experiences in the way of trance. Second, by my reasoning upon them. And third, by my intuitional nature coming in contact with the higher relations of spirit life. And here again, I must remark that in my time, they were not original, but they were simply the reflex of spirits on my receptive organism. In an allegorical sense, these writings <clears throat> can injure no one, but when used by priests to gain power, as they kept as they keep the key to themselves, enslaving the intellects of their fellow men. We believed in reincarnation. We believed in the language of Buddha, that as long as there was a decline of virtue in the world, a good man was raised up to reestablish morality, and that this man was either Buddha himself or that his conception. He was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit of Buddha. These epistles or gospels 
brought from India by Apollonius, were modified by him to suit his spiritual nature. Much of the force and sublimity of language in them is lost in their translation, though, through so many tongues. As near as I can give you their name, they would be called, in your language, translated from Hindu, the Code of the Initiated. There was at that time in India a sacred order in which all persons of good blood, not that there is anything encased, sure that is, uh, were to become pupils and gradually go from one degree to another, similar to modern Freemasonry. No one was admitted as a pupil unless first examined to see whether he or she or he had any spiritual gifts, and this was tested in different ways. One of the principal tests was looking through a hollow tube on a piece of glass or piece of skin. If he discovered any sign of either, this was evidence of clairvoyance. Others were tested by a tube shaped like a horn placed on the ear. If they heard a voice or any noise or anything was photographed upon their brain, they were admitted on the ground of clairaudience. By this method, we were always enabled to have mediums that not only preached our philosophy, but proved it also. I have certified to all I think that it is necessary and I have fulfilled my duty to the best of my present ability. And if I am not mistaken, this communication, which is launched in this humble home today, will undoubtedly be looked upon in the future as one of the marvels of spiritualism, considering the source from which it comes. Wise spirits, not that I lay claim to wisdom, never enter where pride shuts them out. Humility is the best preparation any medium needs to receive the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I think that's important. Um, okay, so now we're on to the comments here from Manning. Um, we can find no historical reference to any such person as Diva, Bodhisattva, Fausa, or Ma Ming, and are therefore compelled to confine our test of its genuineness and authenticity to what we can learn regarding Abel Remusant, again that's Abel, A-B-E-L-R-E-M-U-S-A-T, referred to in the communication. We take the following facts concerning Remusant from the Nouvelle Bi Biographe Générale, and that is Jean, P John, Jean Pierre Abel Remusant, a celebrated Orientalist born at Paris, the 5th of September, 1788, died of cholera in the same city, Ju the 4th of June, 1832. The circumstances that awakened in him a taste which was soon to develop into a true vocation were as follows. The Abbey of the Tarsan had united to the Abbey of aux Bois a precious collection of antiques and objects of curiosity to which was joined a library composed of rare books relating to the different objects of the museum. Amid these amateur treasures was a Chinese pastoral poem, a bel remissant being permitted to visit the collection of the Abbey of Tursan from the first gave special attention to that work and determined to give a translation of it. Animated by his tastes and his desire for the distinction, because it had defied the learning of the time, he surrounded himself with all the works, small in number and insufficient as they were, which treated of sonography of the Chinese writing. The track was roughed and almost impracticable in the state in which he found the undertaking, but he persevered because he felt he had found the way. Without neglecting his profession of medicine, he found time to learn the Tartar language 
copied all by the alphabets he could use to procure and in manner made a vocabulary for his own use. After five years of labor, he published his essay on the Chinese language and literature. In doing so, this he gave to his attention, particularly to the Chinese writing and composition origin from a variety of characters. From this, he pursued the art of reading and writing the Chinese tongue and finally treated of the influence of accentuation exercised over the phonetic value of words. Okay, so that was on a bel remissant. Uh, this essay was followed by a work in 1811 entitled The Study of Foreign Languages Among the Chinese, which has attracted the greatest attention. In 1813, he published his Uranographic Monologue and his dissertation of the monosyllabic nature commonly attributed to the Chinese tongue. On the 19th of November, 1814, he was appointed professor of Chinese in the College of France. From that time, his life was devoted to the study of languages of the extreme Orient. In 1820, he made public his researches concerning the Tartar language or memoirs on different points of the grammar and literature of the Uyghurs and Tibetans. After mentioning several essays and other works of Remesant, the writer in the Nouvelle Biographie Generale says, the study of Chinese documents, both printed and in manuscript, enabled the learned synagogue to indicate to courtier according to Japanese encyclopedia. The locality where the camel monks collected the salts of ammonia and to reveal the existence of two burning volcanoes situated in Central Asia, 400 leagues from the sea, information of which Humboldt, traveling in Chinese Tartary, was pleased to recognize as correct. The Japanese encyclopedia is the most important work in relation to information concerning the state of the scenarios, arts, and occupations in China. Its entire civilization is therein described. Abel Ramassant early gave a translation of the titles of the chapters of it, with that of an entire article relative to the tapir that the imagination of the Chinese had transferred into a sort of fabulous animal. Quote, Historically, Abel Ramassant was particularly occupied with the Tartar nations, and he knew how to profit by the relations of the Chinese with them to solve many historical problems. Instead of making the barbarians who overrun the Roman Empire descend from the north, he showed their original, he showed their oriental origin and the different localities of them in the countries of Asia. The true object of the researchers of Abel Ramassant concerning the religions of China was Buddhism. These memoirs from his pen appeared on this subject in the Journal des Savants of 1831. Soon after, he published his translation of the Book of Rewards and Punishment of the Popular Morale Code. His labors on the history of Buddhism are numerous. The discovery that he made in Japanese Encyclopedia of the List of 33 First Patriarchs of Buddhism with the date of birth and death of the greater number among them, relative to the Chinese chronology, entitled him, at least approximately, to fix the epoch of the death of Buddha, which would have taken place 950 years before Jesus Christ. One of the centers of Buddhism was Rotan, R-O-T-A-N, which also became a great center of civilization. Abel Ramassant translated the history of that city. It was at this period that the Pentaglot Dictionary, called by the author of Som or Whole in Buddhism, was conceived. The translation of that collection, undertaken by Abel Ramassant and E. Bornehof, 
was originally begun. The former of these savants also intended to translate the journeyings of the religious votaries of China going on pilgrimages to visit the places consecrated by the Buddhistic legends. Death surprised him, so to speak, with pen in hand. Such was the learned Oriental scholar to whom the Hindu spirit prophet referred. Whether this Buddhistic patriarch, either under the name of Diva Bodhisattva or Falsa or Mao Ming, was found <clears throat> recorded in the line of patriarchs of Buddhism by Remesson in the Japanese encyclopedia, or not, we cannot tell. Should it be there, it would hardly be possible to doubt the authenticity of this strange and, as we incline to believe it, most important communication in the absence of positive knowledge upon this point, we are warranted in giving great weight to the reference of this Buddhistic spirit to the Japanese encyclopedia and its partial translation by Remesant in 1821. But most significant of all is the fact that Remesant, in his labor of translating that noted Oriental work, discovered a chronological list of the names of 33 of the first Buddhistic, Buddhistic patriarchs with the time of birth and death of most of them, so fully given as to determine which considerable certainty that the Buddhistic religions has its origin about 950 years before the Christian era, so called. If we could obtain that chronological list of the first 33 patriarchs of Buddhism, and if it should prove that Ma Ming was among them, and that he was the Buddhistic patriarch about 200 years before the Christian era, as the communication seems to imply, it would be impossible to doubt the genuineness and authenticity of this communication. We will now proceed to analyze this very remarkable communication when the indirect evidence of its authenticity will become almost irresistible. The spirit tells us that he was a trance medium and that under the control of spirits he wrote several books, that they were written in the Mahubhata, that's M-A-H-A-B-A-R-A-T-A, -A -A, country, which we understand to mean that in that portion of India, where the Vedic poem called the Matrubhatra was composed and held as sacred, that he, that he, it was who first taught in the metaphysical allegorical style 200 BC, that he afterwards sent the books thus written to Singapore, that Apollonius of Tyana 250 years afterwards found them in that center of Buddhism, that Apollonius bore them away with him, making such alterations in them as better suited his spiritual philosophy, that they were originally used to typify the four seasons caused by the annual revolution of the earth around the sun, but they were used or misused to typify a savior of men, that as understood by Hindu priesthood, they implied the time for preparing the ground, planting the seed, the harvest and gathering in time, and the feasting time or harvest home, that those books were interpreted by the successive appearances of the stars of the zodiac, quotes the star in the east, simply being in the signal of seeding or planting time that these books were also used by the Hindu priests to show certain things in the life of man that resembled the offices of nature. The stars were used by them as an almanac, as a rural calendar, and as relating to the life of man, he might have added forth use of them as relating to the atmospheric or meteoric changes of the four seasons. No one who has given any attention to the subject of the Brahmanical Buddhist Zoroastrian, Z-O-R-O-A-S-T-R-I-A-N, 
Egyptian, Grecian, and Roman religions were all preceded the so-called Christian religion. Can doubt or question the fact that they were they were one and all based upon the annual revolution of the earth around the sun and the natural changes which were thus produced on the earth and which especially affected the comforts, interests, and happiness or the misery, misfortunes, and calamities of the human race. Such were the religious and philosophic philosophies everywhere met with by Apollonius of Tiana in his long and active journeyings throughout the then civilized world. That the books obtained by him at Singapore, India, were of that nature cannot be reasonably questioned. Those Buddhistic books were afterwards written as had been alleged by the spirit of Euphilias, U-L-P-H-I-L-A-S, Bishop of the Goths, and Apollonius himself, in the Hebraic Samaritan tongue, the written language of his native country. They were afterwards copied by Hegesippius, H-E-G-E-S-S-I-P-P-U-S, -E -E in the same tongue, and from the copy of Hegesippius to Euliphias made his translation into the Gothic tongue. This Gothic Bible of Euliphas is sufficiently extant today in the Codex Argenteus, A-R-G-E-N-T-E-U-S, to show that it is identical with the canonical books of the New Testament. We have thus a direct connection between the Gothic Bible of Euliphias and the Hindu writings brought from India by Apollonius. This singularly disclosed transmission of Hindu theology to Europe seems to be fully confirmed by the otherwise meaningless decorations of Christian churches and the ceremonial mummeries of the Christian hierarchies, which are identical with the decorations of the caves and temples of India and the feasts and fasts and ceremonies observed and conforced by the Brahmical and Buddhistic Hindu priesthoods. Now, it is a positive fact, especially noted by the learned Charles Francis Dupis, D-U-P-U-I-S, in his great work, The History of All Systems of Worship, that upon the door of the main entrance to the Church of Notre Dame at Paris, dedicated to the worship of Mary, the alleged mother of Jesus Christ, are the delineated in Basso Revilio, our series of ideas, alluded to by the spirit purporting to be Ma Ming. They consist first of a series of twelve panels arranged around the outer margin of the door, corresponding with the signs of the zodiac, arranged in groups of three, each corresponding with the four seasons. The panel of eleven of those signs contain each of the represent respective symbol representing it, to wit, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, etc. But in the square corresponding with Virgo, the celestial or zodiacal virgin, the symbol of a young woman, is absence, and in its place is a figure of the sculptor himself at his work. The virgin of the zodiac which should have occupied that panel, is placed in the large central panel of the door, holding in her arms the infant effigy or representation of the newborn son, S-U-N, which, according to all the so-called heathen systems of religion, was supposed to be born of the zodiacal virgin at midnight at the winter solstice an event which Christians celebrate in concert with the heathens of every this writing because it'd be a little bad on the printer uh, every one maybe or condition of savagery or civilization 
at the precise hour. The Church of Notre Dame, or Our Lady, stands on the site of a sacred grove of the ancient Gaelic Druids, consecrated to the mother goddess of the northern nations, afterward appropriated by the Roman emperors of Gaul as the site of a temple, consecrated to Venus, the Roman goddess of love and beauty, and now consecrated to Mary, the Christian successor of the same zodiacal virgin mother of the sun, S-U-N. On the same door of this noted Christian church is another series of panels in which are arraigned figures of men denoting the different stages of each individual life on earth, the dress and garments of which denote the changes of the temperature of the seasons. On the same door is still another series of figures showing the various rural occupations of the year. Similar devices, say Dupius, ornament the doors of the Church of St. Denis, also in Paris, showing beyond all question that the Christian religion is nothing more than the same old theological monosaur Tonson of heathendom come again in a Christian garb. In a view of such facts as these, who can doubt the pagan origin and nature of the Christian religion? We feel sure these spirits' revelations are continued, that every possible doubt to this point will be done away with. What this Hindu spirit says to, as to the incarnation of the deity, the mediumistic character of the Buddhistic priesthood, their methods of selecting their priests and teachers, the spiritual origin of their religion and the sacred writings, and indeed all he says is worthy of the deepest consideration of all who desire to know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth concerning the mutual relations of the world of mortals and the world of spirits. If they will give it the consideration they will wonder more and more how such important information is given through the medianship of an unlearned man, and why it has been so long withheld. We confess our own amazement as we proceed in our researches, at the prospective store of knowledge that is soon to be poured, in one unbroken flood, upon the minds of thoughtful and intelligent people. Uh, note by the compiler. Mr. Roberts in the above comment states that he was unable to find any historical reference to Bodhis Tua and therefore was compelled to depend upon the works of Ebel Remusant for corroboration of the, identi of the identity of this spirit. Just as the manuscript was being put into type, the most valuable information came to hand from an unlooked for source which was provided to be the much sought after line of the patriarch spoken of in the communication. In this we find that the Bodhistua said in this we find what Bodhistua says is absolutely correct, and that he did live at the time stated, did transfer the gospels, etc. We regard it as a most significant fact that just at this time we should be able to refer to our readers to the work of Abel Remusant entitled Milenges Astiques. Uh, I think that's French, uh, M E L A N G E S, uh, and then it's Astiques, I guess the antique, A S I A T I Q U E S. And that's from which the following is translated Compiler, signed Compiler. The eleventh of the line of patriarchs was Funeche, F-O-U-N-A-Y-C-H-E, who was succeeded by Ma Ming, or the celebrated Fosa. His name in Sanskrit was Diva Bodhistua. This one, who was of the order of the incarnate divinities, coming immediately after Buddha, has given into the whole class of gods of the second order the different names that he has received in the languages of the various Buddhistic people. The Hindus calls him Bodhistua, 
which signifies sensitive intelligence. The, Tiba the Tibetans have changed his name into, oh, this is a tough one, uh, D-J-A-N-G-T-C-H-H-O-U-B, or another really tough one, uh, D uh, J A N G T C H H O U B S E M S P A H. Can't even take a stab at that one. That's tough. Uh, the Chinese have attributed it into some falsa, which, by a very ridiculous misunderstanding, some Chinese idolaters and following them, many missionaries have given him the name of Goddess of Porcelain. They have lavished most honorable titles on him, such as most intelligent, most victorious, omnipotent, most holy son of Buddha, born of his mouth. We do not have at present to seek the allegorical sense of all these names. But it is very important to determine the age of the historical personage to which to whom they attributed them for Bodhis Tua seems to have been one of the reformers to whom the Buddhist philosophy is most indebted. Georgie has taken I'm sorry, Georgie has given vent to a crowd of conjectures upon this subject. He takes Bodhis Tua from Samankodom, S-O-M-O-N-A-K-O-D-O-M, or from Buddha, and besides, for a celebrated religious person in China in the 4th century after our era under the name of Fothou Ching, that's F-O-T-H-O-U-T-C-H-H-I-N-G, and even... For the Skidiaths of Mainz, S-C-Y-T-H-I-A-N-U-S, or Mainz, M-A-N-E-S, by reason of this error, he makes him law and makes him live in the third century of our era. I must confess that Chinese authors themselves differ upon the epoch of this celebrated man. Some make him live 300 years after Buddha, other make, others make 600 years interval, others still 800 years interval, but the book of Maya, M-A-H-A-Y-A, -A -A, whence is borrowed the succession of the patriarchs, cuts this difficulty since it makes Bodhis Tua die in the 37th year of Hinu Wang. And that's 332, and that's spelled H-I-A-N hyphen Wang, W-A-N-G, 332, before J-C, Jesus Christ, or 618 years after the death of Muni, M-O-U-N-I. He was born into the kingdom of Polone, P-O-L-O-N-A-I, and had received from the Faronchi, the F-O-U-N-A-Y-C-H-E, the deposit of the doctrine which he transmitted, transmitted to the 13th patriarch named Cabamaro. This one traveled in the west part of the Indies and delivered his body to the flames in the 41st year of Nan Wang, N-A-N Wang, just like it sounds, 274 before Jesus Christ. Uh, another note by the compiler here. Our readers will notice that the spirit of Bodhis Tua says he received the Gospels, which afterward laid the foundation of the Christian religion from spirit sources. He began a, tra he began a trance medium. The translation of Remissant claims, however, that he received them from his predecessor, Fouinchi, F-O-U-N-A-Y-C-H-E. This evident contradiction is easily accounted for, as it is not likely that after taking so much trouble to suppress all evidence of the real origin of the Christian Gospels, that an attempt would not be made to mislead in this direction. The great wonder is that at any that <clears throat> the great wonder is that at 
this late day so much evidence can be obtained, which only shows that at some point in their calculations, a misstep was made and that this evidence was overlooked, which makes it possible that in this 19th century, the true facts may be brought to light. The manner in which the last information was obtained is, of in itself, strong testimony to the fact that through truth may be that though truth may be suppressed for a time, it cannot be crushed, that it will not come, that it will not come uppermost at last. I'm sorry, let me read that bit. It cannot be so crushed that it will not come uppermost at last. Our readers will do very well to carefully study this communication as it will shed more light upon the supposed divine origin of the Christian Gospels than any other information extant or existent, proving that the priesthood after obtaining them changed them to suit their own views and purposes, thus preventing the truth to the detriment of all mankind. Signed, the Compiler. So we're going to stop there with Diva Bodhis Tua. And that is on page 57.